So this will be fun today. <laughs> Always. Hi, everybody. This is Carmen DeValis, and I am founder of Doggies for Dementia Foundation. And welcome to Experts Dig In with Doggies for Dementia. And I have a wonderful guest today. And this is actually our part two, because there was so much information we needed to continue it. And this is Ron Nevelo is with us today. Welcome, Ron. And uh, <laughs> he is co-founder of Inspire Senior Care, which is a mental health practice. And you are a clinical trainer and a licensed clinical social worker. Did I do that OK, Ron? Did you get the uh, VP of Business Development part in, too? The, thank you for that. VP of Business Development. You're and, so uh, did we say certified dementia practitioner? We got that part in too, didn't you? Yeah, you did. Good job. Well yeah, done. I love that. So, you know, we are talking about some really important things today, like the uh, looking to how we can prevent and slow down the progression of cognitive problems and, and therefore dementia. And so that certified dementia practitioner is important because you really understand this. And um, I'm excited about this because I don't know of anyone who doesn't want to try to prevent dementia. It's a super scary thing for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So what do you have to tell us today? You know, I'm going to have questions. because. Well, let's talk <laughs> about, you know, the thing that I think is um, real important that I want to get across today is let's talk about early intervention. Mm -hmm. So in order to do early intervention, you know, the big mistake I see in working with seniors and at Inspire, we're working with seniors living in senior living communities. That's our thing. And we're doing mental health work. Yeah, we're doing that professional counseling, especially during this pandemic where uh, it, it's, it's not only a physical health crisis, it's a mental health crisis. It's, it's also, though, a brain health crisis because with people being so isolated, they can't do the things so many, well, not that they can't. It's more challenging to do the things that they would normally do to keep a healthy brain, which we talked in our first segment, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I noticed in working with these seniors in communities is so often that when I approach them or talk to them about getting our help or letting us evaluate them, to see how well their brain is functioning when they start to notice things. They often have noticed things, but they don't want to get evaluated. They believe they're fine, that it's only normal aging. And that's true on some people. Uh, aging will slow our brains down. Retirement will slow it more down if, they, if you don't stay really active and doing the things um, similar using the same brain processes that you used while you were uh, pre-retirement, uh, there can be issues there too. But what I noticed is people don't want to uh, get it checked out. They'll go to a doctor when they're having symptoms, they'll go get an annual physical, but when I ask them about getting an evaluation for the brain, they're not interested. And what they do is they wait until it's obvious to them that they that there's a problem and it's obvious to other people. Mm. In my experience, when it's obvious to other people and to yourself, at that point, you probably either already have or are close to getting dementia. Yeah, I have a question for you around that and something yeah. I saw clinically. So for you, is it the referral then, or when someone comes to you and you hear about it, that you're gonna go, you're gonna do an evaluation for some, with someone? Is it the family that alerts you? Is it the care staff? And because you're mostly in long-term communities, correct? Yeah, we work in independent living, assisted living, and memory care communities. Right. So where's the referral coming from then? Is it the, the resident themselves or um, family or the community? Yes. All the above. <laughs> Yeah. We even had a referral once from uh, the maid of one of the residents. Really? We get them from anywhere. What we don't do is we don't go knocking on anyone's door. Um, so someone's got to hear about us, learn about us, and then be interested enough in talking to us. Mm -hmm. you know, my, you know, I do business development, another nice word for marketing. 
Uh, but I like to see what I do as servant marketing, which means I'm not trying to sell anyone. I try to educate people. Uh, right. And I try to educate people about brain health uh, and dementia uh, so that they can make an informed choice to see what is best for them and what they need to do. Because so many people don't understand what they're dealing with. Of for course. instance, one of the things is, okay, so what is dementia and how is it different from Alzheimer's? And <laughs> most people think of it as two separate things because we hear it talked about differently. Mm -hmm. So quick little education piece here. Uh, dementia is a syndrome, meaning it's a variety of symptoms. It's not necessarily the same thing, but it always has to do with brain. It typically has to do with memory loss of some type. And it is a progressive illness, meaning it will not get better. It will only get worse over time. And at this point in time, we don't have a cure for it. We don't. So once you get it, it's going to get worse. Now, there are different types of dementia. The most common type is Alzheimer's. Probably 60 to 80 plus percent of dementia diagnoses happen to be Alzheimer's. There are other types such as uh, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, um, frontal temporal dementia. There are a lot of different types, right? But like Alzheimer's is the predominant one. Yeah, yeah, and, and so I'm, you know, I'm thinking about if either what happens when people are experiencing some problems, if they do recognize it or a family does. And even after working with people for decades, right, when I, when, for when I wrote my book, I went and I, I visited a long time with family, 13 different families to hear their stories. And it surprised, and some of those were my patients too, but this is a couple years later. And it surprised me to learn what they were really thinking and what their fears were and why they didn't step forward. And um, some of it had to do with the fear or even feeling shame or embarrassment that their family member would have this because all the stigma surrounding it, that it would change their lives so much and their friends would dissipate essentially. And, you know, all these things, which is kind of true for them in that there's so much fear around it. Um, you know, people will just kind of um, withdraw. And, Absolutely. The, yeah. the fear I have for people <laughs> is that that fear holds them back. And if they wait too long and they develop dementia, we can't treat them in a way that will reverse the effects and get them healthy again. Because right. it's a progressive illness. It's a progressive one. It's going to get worse. So the key is stopping it before you ever get it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always tell people, you need to get checked out regularly. When you start noticing any slowing down of the brain, get to a professional, let them check it out. If they tell you it's fine, that it's age appropriate, then go whew, dodge that one. And then if you notice it getting any worse at all, go get checked out again. Because right. it very well may be out of the ordinary. When it gets out of the ordinary, you're talking about probably a very mild to mild cognitive impairment. That's the term, cognitive impairment. Or uh, what people are calling a mild cognitive impairment, MCI. It's getting a lot of press right now. Um, that is the precursor to dementia. The good thing is that can be reversed. Mm -hmm. That can be turned back. And you can, if you do the right things, you can get to a point where you're back to an age appropriate level. In the work we do at Inspire, we do that all the time with people. We're getting people back in shape. That's what we call it brain fitness. We do a brain fitness program, like physical fitness, right? Mm -hmm. We get the brain back in shape. And that's what's needed to do. Because what we often see with seniors is particularly, and it's my group that we work with typically is the uh, retired group. And what I've noticed is that when people retire, if they don't do the things, they don't use their brain in the same way. They're not doing the same things, they're retired. But if they don't replace what they used to do with other things to use the same part of the brain, mm -hmm. if you don't use it, you're gonna lose it. That's the old expression and we find that to be very true. If you're not using your brain, it's going to slow down. And, and what I find is probably about 
two years after retirement is when we start to notice uh, some things start to slow down if they haven't replaced it with other things. Right, right. Yeah, and, and so that piece of education that you referred to earlier is just so important because that's what can change the tide. And maybe we can see some of those huge predictions of where we're going to be in 10, 20 years not be so bad if we really um, take it to heart and um, do the right things like we do in other areas for our bodies. You know, we, we know about nutrition. Maybe we don't do it, but we know about it, right? It's, it's not, right. And not a matter of not knowing for most people. It's a matter of not doing. But um, I think when it comes to the brain health, it's a matter of not knowing as well than, of, than the choices what to do. Do we do it or not? But the not knowing piece is huge in that, in that um, example. And, and when you think about the consequences of a brain that slows down too much, particularly if it turns into dementia, which uh -huh. will get worse, right? That's the message I am sending to everyone <laughs> really strongly. Yeah. Um, and, if and you really think good. about it and don't just go like this, oh, you know, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to see it, then you got to do something about it because retirement should be good years. Now, that's the years you've earned. That's where you get to kind of do what you want, enjoy your leisure time, and look back on memories and talk to whoever you want and travel and do those fun things. And, and all of that you might very well be able to do. And if your brain slows down too much and if you get dementia, you are going to lose that stuff. And if you get dementia, you will eventually lose all of that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, it, it's a sad thing for anyone who's been around someone with uh, a moderate to severe dementia, you know, something that's really uh, obvious um, that uh, they're just struggling to hold on to anything, including recognizing their own children. Right. And then eventually not recognizing themselves. It's a terrible disease. And it's so worth doing the things that you need to do before it's too late. Because once it's in, it's in. So you got to stop it beforehand. Right. And that's part of our mission as well, as I hear that in years, is that education piece. Because I, I believe a lot of people, when, you, when they, and I've asked like groups of educated people who didn't know much about dementia, what, what do they know about it? And pretty much what they describe is like the very later stages. And so the thought of where that started, say 10 years ago, and what it looked like isn't really well understood or even recognized. And, and I think that's another important piece in what we, what we do too with the images is, yes, these are the many faces of dementia and what you can do here too, um, because it's not all elderly. Um, who who develop the uh, the disease and it's uh, you know it, we, it's not most people thought it was a really fast course and uh, you get diagnosed and you die shortly after but and that's certainly not the truth either no. and um, and and I think understanding that piece that yes it's a long course for the most part and it progressively gets worse gives you even more hope to say intervene soon to stop it, stop the progression and or slow it way down. And you know, people, this whole idea of let's focus so much on dementia and ignore the pre-dementia intervention stuff that we need to do. You know, it, it's not just the seniors, the insurance field is doing the same thing. You know, <laughs> uh, our, our programming, our brain fitness program designed to among other things, prevent dementia, is not covered by your regular insurance policies. They're gonna wait until you have dementia, which means at that point, we can't reverse it. Why won't they pay for, I mean, if I had a choice between them paying for our brain fitness for people with dementia and people without, you know, that are pre-dementia, that I can really help and get them healthy again, I, I'd want that group, right? But. Yeah. Other than Medicare, fortunately, traditional Medicare covers our program. That's why 85% oh. of our is, is paid for by traditional Medicare, right? Yeah. But these other companies decided, no, nah, we're not sure about you guys just yet, even though it's everything you're doing is consistent with global research and there's a lot of material to back up what you're doing. We're just going to pay for the people with dementia. I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> but uh, that's what's going you know on. 
early screening and um, you know things around early screening things are often covered but this piece isn't that's interesting um yeah well um how about we talk a little bit about what brain fitness looks like okay so brain fitness and this is going to tie into uh, our earlier interview right uh there are there are five things that people should be doing and um and i'll talk about the first four briefly and then i'm going to get into the fifth one which is what we primarily focus on uh first one exercise I had a client once that said, I hate exercise. I don't like to exercise. I go, okay, do you like a healthy brain? Yeah, if that's what you need to, if you hate exercise, really don't like exercise, and that's what's keeping you because you tell yourself over and over again, I hate exercise, well, then you're not gonna do it. So you need to stop thinking of it that way and say, do I want a healthy brain or do I want to slide into dementia? You know, if you wanna slide into dementia, don't exercise, absolutely. But if you want to avoid it, then yeah, you need to get on an exercise program. Every day. I can only imagine her response like, oh man, when you put it that way. <laughs> but that's it really. I mean, yep. yeah. And, and the sad part about that particular client who I adored, I loved her. She was one of the first ladies I worked with. And uh, at some point while we were working with her and got her in really good shape, she decided she didn't need us anymore. And I tried to talk her out of it and I couldn't. And about a year later, she developed dementia, and another year later, she was gone. Oh. It was sad. It was sad. Now, that's not the norm, and right. we were really effective at doing what we did. So exercise number one. Number two, social interaction. Engage with people socially. Use your brain in all the ways that you use it when you're talking to people. Number three, uh, eat uh, brain foods, which another way of saying that is uh, eating um brain, uh, heart healthy foods, you know, like Mediterranean diet, uh, fruits and vegetables, particularly blueberries, love blueberries. That's the, probably the number one brain food, salmon, broccoli, spinach, kale, nuts, and dark chocolate in limited amounts. All good brain food. Number four, taking care of your physical and emotional health. That means getting enough sleep, taking your medication, staying hydrated, seeing your doctor when you need to, and taking care of your body and your brain wherever possible. Let me stop you right there really quick. So yep. those of you who are just seeing this part, don't worry about the details on that because you can go to part one because we talked about all those four things Ron just mentioned um, in detail. So no fear there. We're just, we're just deep diving into the, uh, the fifth one on your list, which is in no particular order of that. Absolutely. Thank you for reminding me <laughs> of that. Number five is what uh, we at Inspire are primarily doing with our clients in our brain fitness program in senior living communities, which is challenging cognitive activities. Not cognitive activities, challenging cognitive activities. That's a real important distinction. Mm -hmm. so, what that's about is that what they're finding, what global research has proven is that challenging cognitive activities get the brain in better shape, uh, for helping it uh, fight off dementia and when dementia is already in to slow it down when possible. But we're, I wanna focus on preventing dementia if at all possible. So challenging cognitive activities is another way of putting it is some type of activity where you got to really work at using your brain and it doesn't just stop when you're done. Like I can't just go to a lecture and go, oh, that was fascinating. And then I'm done with it. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, there's no lasting effect with that. So what am I talking about? I'll give you a bunch of examples. Uh, one, one of the best, the best thing challenging cognitive activity, learn something new. Doesn't matter what, learn anything new. There's actual research actual research that shows that learning how to knit is good for your brain. There's another research that shows learning digital photography is good for your brain. It's not what you're learning, it's that you're learning something new. So for seniors, what do I suggest? Technology. It's the big thing that most seniors aren't on to. They don't know all the intricacies of it. A lot of them don't know any of it. They don't have a Facebook page. They don't know how to surf the web. Uh, they don't know how to use a uh, Zoom like you and I are using right now, Carmen, right? Uh, mm -hmm. To talk to people and connect with them. Um, and they can be taught by their grandchildren. They can uh, call for a volunteer from a senior agency. 
Uh, there are a million people out there who know technology who, who would be happy to teach them. In fact, my people teach our clients all the time. Why? Because we're teaching them something new. And it's a whole world you open up to because in today's society, in today's generation, so much of it is digital, it's virtual, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's technology has taken over so much. And it's not that you have to give up what you used to enjoy. It's there's another world out there. Yeah, and it's a gateway to learn other new things. So you learn your way around YouTube a little bit, you can learn how to knit with that instruction that you're getting from people who do that on YouTube and other channels and tons of stuff. And you know, I, I wanna, um, I, I love the technology piece and I think there's easy ways to do that, like learn how to go to this side. And my mother is 82, 83 and she's does she learn the computer and when she has troubles we help her with it but she knows the basic things and it's been really good for her since she hasn't been able to work and um so i've seen that too and i think some of the things you mentioned like the knitting and um did you say musical instrument no but that would be fine too i mentioned yeah. digital photography but it doesn't okay, matter yes yeah and and some of those can be so meditative also you know it, it's that repeat 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 which is calming right and um i know knitting does that for me photography does completely i can look and go what where'd those two hours go and i've just been in my backyard you know absolutely yeah, yeah. and so that creativity piece is it, that's one of our basic needs too that often gets overlooked as we get older I just Absolutely. wanted to add that because <laughs> I heard it, yeah. So if you, um, once you learn how to uh, get on the web, you know, and surf the web and see what's out there um, on the internet, uh, you can find things like um, programs that will teach you for free a language or reteach you. Mm -hmm. I had a woman I was working with that was a dual language major and a translator, but hadn't spoken either language in forever. And I asked her about it and she said, uh, I don't miss Spanish. I never liked Spanish, but I miss French. And I said, you want to relearn French? Now, I didn't speak it. I just went on the web. I found this program and we pulled it up and it taught her again how to speak French language. Mm -hmm. You can learn and these programs will teach you virtually any language. In fact, for science, for science fiction people, if you know Star Trek, they even have one for teaching Klingon, which yeah. is a made up language for a TV show, but it was, you know, they kind of created it and now they have a program teaching you how to do Klingon. Oh my gosh, how fun is that? Yeah, yeah, it's just a whole world out there that it's, it's almost like you can learn anything. Yeah, the key is it's got to challenge you. And, you know, particularly like if you're taking a class and for seniors there, you know, if you live near a community college or a small college, some of these places are offering free classes to seniors, mm -hmm. uh, I know. So you just got to check out and see, or libraries that are public libraries, they're doing free courses for seniors uh, in yeah. teaching technology too. But it opens up because once you understand the technology piece, you can go learn most anything. Mm -hmm. um, some other things that I've done before with people is uh, I taught someone how to play Sudoku, the Sudoku puzzles, which are uh, number puzzles. Uh -huh. Which personally, I prefer them to crossword puzzles because crossword puzzles, you have to know the topic to be able to fill in the, the letters because you got to know the answer or figure it out. Uh, Sudoku, it's just numbers. It's, as long as you know the numbers one to nine, it's doable. Hmm. So, but to learn it, you have to know strategy, that's decision making. You have to use your short term visual and verbal memory and learning it and seeing things and noticing things. And you have to use your focus to be able to stay concentrated enough on it to see what you need to see. So there are different things that you're using you know, processing speed so you don't spend forever on it. You're doing a lot of different uh, brain things to help you on it. Now, if I do a puzzle that's so easy for me to do, am I doing a challenging cognitive activity? No, I'm having fun. Mm -hmm. That's See, that's where it's like, no, it's not challenging anymore. <laughs> so I'm talking about challenging cognitive activities. Right. You, also, you also wanna do challenging cognitive activities that are working on the part of your brain that you need to work on. So the big myth is, which I, I think I talked about in the other one, is uh, if you go into senior living communities, you will find they will offer their seniors crossword puzzles, typically in word finds or word puzzles, right? 
very common. And when I've talked to seniors, they're often like, oh yeah, I'm, I, I've got my brain health stuff taken care of. I do my crossword puzzle every day. Mm -hmm. Well, if you ask them what's crossword puzzle working on, they don't know. And I'll tell you what it's working on. It's working on long-term memory. And if you don't have dementia yet, you typically don't have any trouble with long-term memory at all and don't need to work on it, okay? And it's working on word retention. If you don't have dementia, word retention isn't an issue either. Those are issues for people with dementia, right? Yeah. So what you need to be working on is short-term memory, processing speed, um, focus, uh, deductive reasoning, decision-making. Those are the big things that, you know, and Inspire we work on with our clients, but crossword puzzles don't work on those. Are they fun? Yeah, yeah, they're fun. But when someone tells me they're okay because they're working on them, I'm like, no, <laughs> not at it's all. Just, it's great to have fun. However, you also need the challenging piece too, right? And the challenging piece should be fun. It can yeah. be fun. <laughs> we make it fun. You know, that's why you know, I tell my clinicians all the time, you got to make it fun partially because they have other things they could be doing that they might rather do. And secondly, we don't have them sign a contract. They're not contractually obligated. So they got to want to do it with us. And they do. We find different things for them to do with us that are a lot of fun for them. And it can be. Oh, certainly. So questions then as we wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, I, I know you, you're in Dallas, that's where your home base is. Do you do virtual, any of this virtually? Um, yeah, right now, particularly because of the pandemic, we've been locked out of communities on right. some of the communities. So we've gone to a, a virtual setup also, but we're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, we're in the Houston area. Uh, we are in the San Antonio area, hoping to come to the Austin area sometime soon. Uh, we're also in Illinois. We opened up in Illinois and uh, okay. our intention is to go nationwide because most communities that I'm aware of are not doing what I'm telling you to do. They're, they're mm -hmm. not set up to do it. They do the first four things of prevention well, and it's the fifth one, the challenging cognitive activity. That needs to be a one-on-one -on -one type of thing, and they're not set up to do that. That's why we come in and do that. So sure. we're looking for communities to come in and work with. And if someone can't get us that way, then possibly then we can go the virtual route, which particularly if someone's by themselves, yeah, we can go the virtual route if they have access to it. The, the key for going virtual is they need to know enough to be able to get on a laptop or a um, iPad because right. the phones are just too small for seniors typically anyway. But uh, yeah, yeah, we do that too. Okay, that's wonderful. And I thought of a question and then it slipped my... So while you're thinking of it, let me tell you a little more about uh, Inspire. Yeah. So uh, our programming doesn't require doctor permission. Uh, it just requires that we evaluate them. We always do a two-part evaluation to determine if they need us. So I tell people, if you're not positive, your brain's in good shape, let us give you peace of mind. And if we determine there is something going on, then let us create a program for you. So our program is not a set program. The brain fitness program is a menu of options mm -hmm. that is determined based on what their needs are, what their interests are, and what my clinician can bring to it. For instance, a lot of clinicians aren't doing Sudoku puzzles, but I was because I love them and I'm good at them so I can teach them, okay. right? So that's an interest I have. And if a client, a resident of a community was interested, then yeah, I can teach them that as a part of my process of getting their brain in better shape. Mm -hmm. And it's fun. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. It's very so, individualized. You know, our, our people are all licensed clinical social workers, which means they have a master's degree like me. We, part of the testing includes our psychologist. Uh, 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 part B of um, Medicare covers the cost of our services once they paid their deductible for the year. Once they pay their deductible, no out-of-pocket expense at all. And communities that bring us in, we don't charge them at all. We just want access to their residents because we want to help people. That's right. the key goal. We want to help them maintain their independence and we want them to enjoy the quality of living that they've earned mm -hmm. after all these years. And mm -hmm. it's a lot harder to do once dementia set in. So early intervention. Do not wait. Mm -hmm. It's literally life-saving. We're talking about the quality of one's life and what they're able to do. And um, 
yeah, you just can't really say enough about how important that is. Um, and and if you don't think it's a big deal, then go once you can, because <laughs> the pandemic's <laughs> yeah. locked us out. Yeah. Once you can, go visit, uh, uh, go volunteer for a day at a, um, a memory care community. That's all you need to do. They're the most sweet people. I, I love these seniors we get to work with, and they have the greatest stories. I've heard some of the greatest stories yeah. people have, right? Yeah. But go yeah. visit them in the uh, memory care community and know that all their stories are going to go away. They're going to forget them all. And, and it's a real eye opener to say, oh my God, I have to do something, you know, to get my brain in better shape. And, right. you know, it's, to me, right. it's, it's more of an eye opener than my physical health, uh, only because uh, I'm going to lose everything I've always taken for granted. My memories, my knowledge of people, everything. Brain covers everything. everything. And it just means so much. You know, being someone who photographs that, you know, I'm, I'm witnessing it and, you know, we honor every stage of, of life and sometimes the long term memory is somewhat intact and the stories that come back and, but when the short term is missing the people sitting right there in front of them and they're sharing the story, the connection to them is just kind of not there and that's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Uh, I, I will say that, you know, if someone's worried about that they have dementia, uh, I will often tell them that if they still have short term memory, uh, it's possible they don't have dementia yet. Right. It, it could be bad. When short term memory is gone, they have dementia. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much, that is my unofficial way of, of saying <laughs> it. That's my short version. I always tell people, you know, when we say, do they have dementia? And they go, well, I don't know. And my question is always, do they still have short-term memory? If they go, not really, I'm like, they have dementia. Mm -hmm. But if yeah. they still have short-term memory, they're just struggling with it, <clears throat> then it's very possible that they, they're in the early stages, uh, mm -hmm. that it's pre-dementia, you know, and uh, what we call mild cognitive impairment. And that can be improved and helped and we can get rid of it. And that's right. the good stuff. If you do the five preventative things, that's what you gotta be doing. Yeah, and I'll make the assumption then that when you're with someone and there hasn't been an official diagnosis and things and you're suspecting or wherever they happen to be at, then you're communicating with their primary and such as well so that that medical piece of it, um, you know, the coordination of it is what you're doing. Yeah, so for us, it matters where the referral's coming from. You know, mm -hmm. if, if it's coming from the client themselves, they have to give us permission to talk to people. If they do, and we always ask for it, uh, we, we like to do a three-pronged approach. Us, uh, the staff in the community that, uh, from the community that works with them every day, and the family. Because between the three of us, we're the ones that are interacting with them. We're the ones that know them. So for us to get to know our client, not only are we talking to our clients, we want to talk to the staff that see them every day, and we want to talk to the family that knows their history and, and hopefully sees and talks to them periodically at the least. Right. Is this possible you would get three different versions right there? It is right? possible. Yes. Yes, I know. I uh, know. All right. So if, um, how can people reach you? And do you then take calls, let's say, if there's a long-term care community in Iowa that hears about it and say, hey, we'd like to somehow integrate um, and, and work with you they have a way of contact. I would love nothing more than uh, having a, a community of some type from another state than Texas call me and say, hey, we got something. Because I can virtually get the program set up. And once we're pretty much set up, I, I would travel there and, and, or one of my uh, peers would travel there and, and we would get going. We can go anywhere. You know, we started in Texas. We opened up Illinois. Our intention is um, to go in every state. We have 48 more states and a lot more communities in the two states we're in. We need to reach these people. The brain fitness piece, the mental health practice, you can find pretty much anywhere. Not always that'll come in-house. I mean, we're always going on site. No one comes to us, we go to them because mm -hmm. we're working with seniors. They don't need to come to us, we go to them. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the brain fitness piece that nationwide, the way we're doing it is very unique very few people are offering it. So people don't have access to it. We want to give access to it to anyone that can get it. Yes. So yeah, you know, anyone can contact us. Uh, we'll do whatever we can to get it. 
what, what we probably won't be able to do is if someone says, I have this one person I want you to come see in Iowa. <laughs> yeah, 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 you need a group. That's gonna be hard. Yeah. I get that too. Uh, telehealth, we can do one, but you know, otherwise, yeah, that's a little, a little more challenging. Which, you know, we talk about. Sometimes. Yeah, I do that too. I, I'll go into groups and photograph. I'm like, I need to be busy for the weekend to cover yeah. my my trip and and things like that. And happy. Well, it's, you know, we 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 are running a business, though we're in the helping business. It's still a business. Uh, mm -hmm. People are uh, making their livelihood from this, and they can't make money and provide for their families if they have one client mm -hmm. instead of more. No. So I can't get, my, I can't get cl good clinicians that do quality work when they're seeing one person. It's just not going to happen, mm -hmm. yeah. which is why we tend to go to communities. We don't go to homes because communities, there are lots of people there. So mm -hmm. my clinic, I can send one clinician there to see all the people they need to see. And if they need more, then I'll get a second clinician or a third one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're in Illinois. Uh, what town? Uh, we're in a lot of different ones, but we're not in Chicago. Isn't that interesting? We yeah. started in Naperville uh, okay. and we're all, uh, operations is really kind of out of Naperville. So it's all the towns around Naperville. Okay. Uh, don't ask me what they Illinois. are because I'm not from Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I grew up in central Illinois. That's why I was asking. But, yeah. You know Naperville? No. <laughs> okay. No, I don't think Naperville, I, would... I think, is west, maybe southwest of Chicago. Okay, I was outside of Champaign Urbana, so it's very central. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so, how can people call you or get okay. a hold of you? What's the best way? We want to put so that the best in there. way is go to our website, uh, inspireseniorcare.com. So, that's our company, Inspire Senior Care. We want to inspire you to take care of your brain. So inspireseniorcare.com. If you go there, uh, you're going to see a phone number which you can call. Uh, another thing you could do is just email me directly and that's fine too. Once again, real easy, ron, R-O-N, at inspireseniorcare.com. Real easy. Ron at inspireseniorcare.com or go to our website, inspireseniorcare.com. And we'd be happy to talk to you or in particular, uh, reach out to senior communities that you're living in or that you have an association with or you volunteer at, get them to talk to me and let me tell them all about our program and what we have to offer. And truly, I'm not gonna sell anyone. Remember, servant marketing, that's what I do. I'm here to help. All I'm gonna do is educate them. If they don't want it, that's fine. No pressure, no guilt, even though I am Jewish, so I can do the guilt thing really good, but no, I can do the guilt thing. All, <laughs> I think there's I'm, enough of that going around, Ron, really I'm, now. <laughs> exactly. All I'm going to do is educate. That's what I do. And if they want us, then, then I will do everything I can to get us the high quality service Inspire provides. And if they don't, then I, I will clue them into what they need to do on their own to take care of themselves. And then it's up to them. Beautiful. Yeah, I still love I still love both of our talks, um, and because I hear a lot about dementia care and afterwards and things, which is all very important. And you know, the big for me, I'm like, yeah. And what can we do to slow this down? What can we do to make a big, big change? And so, you know, that's part of our mission too and our platform. So I'm um, have have loved this, and I'm so grateful we connected. So, so now the next time they ask that, you're going to say, uh, go to my website at, I'm, clue, I'm queuing you. What's oh, your website? doggiesfordementia.org. You go to there and, and look up the uh, video that would be under what? Um, yeah, I'm going to have a catchy title on it though, but it's on YouTube for Experts Dig In with Doggies for Dementia. And yeah. they're going to find, and we don't have a title for it yet, but it'll be <laughs> our other uh, training where I'm going to spell out for them with your help all the things they need to be doing that globally they're proving works to prevent dementia or at least at the very least slow it down. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. And thank you all of you for watching. And uh, Ron's information will be in the contact area as well. Thank you very thank you. much. Take care. Get to work learning something new right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take care. Bye-bye.